Time now for the start of a new series of classic albums introduced by Richard Skinner. It's a music business cliche that the second album is the difficult one. The truth is that they all are, especially when the singer writes the songs and produces the record as well. The album we're about to hear was the artist's fifth, and it certainly wasn't easy. The year is 1985, and our classic album is The Hounds of Love. Looking back with me for the next hour is Kate Bush. I think it was probably the most difficult stage I've been at so far. Because the, the dreaming the album before, I'd never produced an album before that one. And because it had a lot of um, unfavourable attention from some people, I think it was felt that me producing Hounds of Love wasn't such a good idea. And for the first time, I felt I was actually meeting resistance artistically. I felt the album had done very well to reach number three, but uh, I felt under a lot of pressure and I wanted to stay as close to my work as possible. And uh, everyone was saying, oh, she's really gone mad now. You know, hey, listen to this. It's a really weird record. But it, it was very important that it happened to me because it made me think, right, do I really want to produce my own stuff? You know, do I really care about being famous? And I was very pleased with myself that, no, it didn't matter as much as making a good album. So we started Hands of Love in our own studio and I started to find out an awful lot of things that I wouldn't have realised otherwise. Um, I relaxed tremendously within my own environment for a start. And also on the dreaming, uh, because I was working in such an experimental way, uh, the studio costs were becoming absolutely phenomenal and I really don't think I could have afforded to have made Hounds of Love in a commercial setup. So um, here I was in a situation of having as much creative control really as I could ever ask for. I had an idea of what I wanted to say in the song and I actually asked Del to write me a drum pattern and um, he wrote this great pattern in uh, the drum machine. So I just put the fair light on top of it and um, that was the basis of the song with the drone which uh, played quite an important part. I was trying to say that really a man and a woman can't understand each other because we are a man and a woman and if we could actually swap each other's roles, if we could actually be in each other's place for a while, I think um, we'd both be very surprised and I think it would lead to a greater understanding and uh, really the only way I could think it could be done was either, you know, I thought a deal with the devil, you know, and I thought, well no, why not a deal with God, you know, because uh, in a way it's so much more powerful the whole idea of asking God to make a deal with you. You see, for me, it is still called Deal With God. That was the, its title. But we were told that um, if we kept this title, that it wouldn't be played in any of the religious countries. So Italy wouldn't play it, France wouldn't play it, um, Australia wouldn't play it, Ireland wouldn't play it. Uh, and that generally, we might get it blacked purely because it had God in the title. Now, I couldn't believe this. This seemed completely ridiculous to me. And the title was such a part of the song's entity. Um, I just couldn't understand it. But nonetheless, although I was very unhappy about it, I felt unless I compromised that I was going to be um, cutting my own throat, you know. I just spent two, three years making an album and we weren't going to get this record played on the radio if I was stubborn. So I felt I had to be grown up about this, so we changed it to Running Up That Hill. But it's always something I've regretted doing, I must say. And normally I always regret any compromises that I make. Uh, Hands of Love. Well, again, this was written at home. This was an early song. And it was inspired um, in some ways by this old black and white movie that uh, is a real favourite of ours called Night of the Demon. It's all about this demon that appears in the trees. And uh, the line at the top of the song, it's in the trees, it's coming, is actually taken from the film. Uh, Morris Denham is the guy that's saying it. When I was writing the song, I sort of started coming across this line about hounds. And I thought, hounds of love, you know, the whole idea of being chased by this love that's actually going to, when it gets you, it's just going to rip you to pieces, you know, and have your guts all over the floor. And so this very sort of, you know, being hunted by love. I, I liked the imagery. I thought it was uh, really good. Um, Big Sky was very difficult to write. Uh, I knew what I wanted to finish up with, but I didn't seem to be able to get there. And we had three different versions. And... Um, Eventually, it just kind of turned into what it did, thank goodness. That 
that was really about, you know the thing of when uh, I used to do it a lot when I was a kid, we'd go out somewhere and sit up and look at the sky, and if you watch the clouds long enough, they take on um, different shapes, you know, you can see dinosaurs in them or castles. And at the time I was writing this album, we were living in the country, and uh, my keyboards and stuff were in this room overlooking the valley, and I'd sit and watch the clouds uh, rolling uphill towards me. And uh, there is a lot of weather on this album. Uh, the countryside was a big inspiration uh, at this time. Uh, and it's always changing. It's a very different perspective from living in a city. Uh, sometimes you hardly see the sky above the buildings at all. The big sky. Kate had first used a fair light on her third album, Never Forever. And by the time she made Hounds of Love, it had become a key element in the creative process. I'd say with this album that most of the songs were written on fair light and synth. And not piano, which is uh, was moving away really from the earlier albums where all my material was written on piano. And there is something about the character of a sound. You hear a sound and it has a whole quality of its own that it can be sad or happy. or And that immediately conjures up images, which can, of course, help you to think of ideas that lead you on to a song. So everything is crucial for trying to find some direction with inspiration and really sounds now, I think, are pieces of gold for people, you know, a good sound is uh, worth a lot artistically. <laughs> uh, quite often I find synthetic sounds create a coldness that if the track is lonely or sad or um, dark, sometimes you want that kind of coldness, that, that machine-like coldness, which is very specific. And with acoustic instruments, you get a real normally a very warm human presence and something that's intimate and really there, something that breathes, you know, it's not this kind of dead, cold machine. Uh, and I, I feel that both are very usable, depending on what you want to say. How about Mother Stands for Comfort, for instance? Well, the personality that sings this track is, um, is very unfeeling in a way. And the cold qualities of synths uh, and machines were appropriate here. Um, there are many different kinds of love. And the track's really talking about um, the love of a mother. And in this case, she's the mother of a murderer, in that um, she's basically prepared to protect her son against anything. Because uh, in a way, it's also suggesting that the son is using the mother as much as the mother is protecting him. It's a bit of a strange subject matter, isn't it, really? <laughs> Mother Stands for Comfort. Our classic album is The Hounds of Love by Kate Bush. And the next track is Cloud Busting. This was very special to me because it was all inspired by a book that I'd found years ago. And uh, I went into a bookshop I used to go into regularly and just saw this. I liked the title. It said A Book of Dreams. And I uh, took the book off the shelf. I'd never done it before, an unknown book. And uh, it was this beautiful story by this guy called Peter Reich. And it's all about his view of his father, but through the eyes of a child. So it was all about his childhood and how he saw his father as this incredibly magical figure. And uh, his father was Wilhelm Reich, and he was a very respected psychoanalyst, I believe. Um, but his work became controversial, and he was eventually arrested and died in prison. But um, one of the things that features in the book is how he used to go with his father cloud busting. And uh, his father had this machine that uh, when you pointed it up to the sky, you could make the clouds disperse or you could gather them together. And if you gathered them together, it would rain. And um, the machine was all based on orgone energy, which was one of the basis of uh, Reich's teachings. And the book is just extraordinary. It's so sad, but it's also got this beautiful kind of happy innocence that goes with childhood. And as the guy grows up in the book, it does get sadder and sadder as you can feel him hanging on to his childhood. And uh, the book really touched me. And the song is, is really trying to, to tell that story. That did all fall apart over a a period of about 10 bars and everything just started falling apart because it didn't end properly and, you know the drummer would stop and then the strings would just sort of start wiggling around and talking and uh, I felt it needed an ending and I didn't really know what to do and then I thought maybe decoy tactics were the way and we covered the whole thing over with a, 
the sound of a steam engine slowing down so that you had the sense of the journey coming to an end. And it worked. It covered up all the falling apart and actually made it sound very complete in a way. And uh, we had oh, terrible trouble getting um, a sound effect of a steam train. So um, we actually made up the sound effect out of the uh, various sounds. And Del was the steam. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got a whistle on the fair light for the poo poo. The continuous flow of music on a compact disc masks the fact that Hounds of Love and The Ninth Wave were conceived as two quite separate sides to the album. Yes, they were. I started off writing, um, I think, Running Up That Hill, Hounds of Love, and then I think probably uh, Dream of Sheep. And once I wrote that, that was it. That was the beginning of what then became the concept. And really, for me, from the beginning, The Ninth Wave was a film. That's how I thought of it. It's the idea of, of this person being in the water. How they've got there, we don't know, but the idea is that they've been on a ship and they've been washed over the side, so they're alone in this water. Now, I find that horrific imagery, the thought of being completely alone in all this water. And uh, they've got a life jacket on with a little light so that if anyone should be travelling at night, they'll see the light and know they're there. And they're absolutely terrified. And they're completely alone at the mercy of their imagination, which again, I personally find such a terrifying thing. The power of one's own imagination being let loose on something like that. And the idea that they've got it in their head that they mustn't fall asleep. Because um, if you fall asleep when you're in the water, I've heard that you roll over and so you drown. So they're trying to keep themselves awake. Um, this was all kind of coming together by itself. I didn't have much to do with this. I just sat down and wrote this little tune on the Fairlight with the cello sound, and it sounded very operatic. And I thought, well, great, because it, you know, it's, it conjured up the image of ice, and um, it was really simple to record. I mean, we, we did the whole thing in a day, I guess. Again, it's very lonely. It's terribly lonely. They're all alone on like this frozen lake. And at the end of it, it's the idea of um, seeing themselves under the ice in the river so I mean, we're talking real nightmare stuff here and uh, at this point when they say you know my god it's me you know it's me under the ice ah! <laughs> uh, these sort of visitors come to wake them up to bring them out of this um, dream so that they don't drown my god my mother's in there my father my brothers Paddy and John Brian Tench the guy that mixed the album with us is in there Del was in there Robbie Coltrane does one of the voices it was just trying to get lots of different characters and all the ways that people wake you up. You must wake like, up. you know, you, you sort of fall asleep at your desk at school and the teachers wake up. couldn't get a helicopter anywhere. And in the end, I asked permission to use the helicopter from the wall, from the Floyd. This is the best helicopter I'd heard for years. <laughs> I think it's very interesting, the whole concept of witch hunting and uh, the fear of women's power. Um, in a way, it's very sexist behaviour. And uh, I feel that female intuition and instincts are, are very strong and um, are still put down, really. Um, and in this song, this woman is being persecuted by the witch hunter and a whole jury, although she's committed no crime, and uh, they're trying to push her under the water to see if she'll sink or float. Ooh, uh. <laughs> You're listening to Classic Albums with me, Richard Skinner, and Kate Bush. And the next track on Hounds of Love is Watching You Without Me. Now, this poor sod has been in the water for hours and been witch-hunted and everything. Um, suddenly they're kind of at um, home, in spirit, seeing their loved one, sitting there waiting for them to come home. And, you know, watching the clock and... Um, obviously very worried about where they are, maybe make, making phone calls and things. But there's no way that you can actually communicate because they can't see you, they can't hear you. And um, I find this really horrific. And these are all like my own personal worst nightmares, I guess, put into song. And uh, when we started putting the track together, I had this idea for these backing vocals, you know, you can't hear me. And I thought that maybe to disguise them so that, you know, you, you couldn't actually hear what the backing vocals were saying. Watching you without me. Next is Jig of Life. At this point in the story, it's the future self of this person coming 
to visit them, to give them a bit of help here. I mean, it's that time they had a bit of help. So it's their future self saying, look, you know, don't give up. You've got to stay alive because if you don't stay alive, that means I don't, you know, and I'm alive. I've had kids. I've, you know, I've been through years and years of life. So you have to survive. You mustn't give up. This is written in Ireland. Um, at one point, I did quite a lot of writing in Ireland, lyrically particularly. And again, it was a tremendous sort of elemental dose I was getting, you know, all this beautiful countryside and spending a lot of time outside and walking. So it, it had this tremendous sort of stimulus from, from the outside. And this was one of the tracks that the Irish musicians that we worked with was featured on. There was a tune that my brother Paddy found, which uh, he said, you've got to hear this, you'll love it. And uh, he was right. <laughs> he played it to me and I just thought, you know, this would be fantastic somehow to incorporate here. We had the whole song, it was all there, but these huge great holes in the choruses and I knew I wanted to put something in there and I'd had this idea to put a vocal piece in there that was like um, this traditional tune I'd heard used in the film Nosferatu and um, really everything I came up with it was rubbish really compared to what this piece was saying so we did some research to find out if it was possible to use it and it was so that's what we did we re-recorded the piece and I kind of made up words that sounded like what I could hear was happening on the original and suddenly there were these beautiful voices in these choruses that had just been like two black holes and uh, it was the idea of turning the whole thing upside down and looking at it from completely above you know I, I had that image of if you were lying in water at night and you were looking up at the sky all the time I wonder if you wouldn't get the sense of as the stars were reflected in the water you know a sense of like you could be looking up at water that's reflecting the stars from the sky that you're in and uh, the idea of them looking down at the earth and um, and seeing these storms forming over America and moving around the globe and they have this like huge fantastically overseeing view of everything everything is in total perspective and way way down there somewhere there's this little dot in the ocean that is them the ninth wave song sequence concludes with the morning fog well, that's really meant to be the rescue of the whole situation. Um, where now, you know, suddenly out of all this darkness and weight comes light. You know, the weightiness is gone and here's the morning. Uh, and it's meant to feel very positive and, and bright and um, uplifting from the very sort of dense darkness of the previous track. And um, Although it doesn't say so, in my mind, this was the song where they were rescued, where they get pulled out of the water. And it's very much a song of, of seeing perspective, of really, you know, of being so grateful for everything that you have, that you're never grateful of in ordinary life because you just abuse it totally. So, and it was, it was also meant to be one of those kind of thank you and good night songs. You know, the, the little finale where everyone does a little dance and then a bow and then... They leave the stage. <laughs> I've never been so pleased to finish anything in my life. There were times I never thought it'd be finished. It, it was uh, it was just such a lot of work. All of it was so much work. You know, the lyrics, trying to piece the thing together. But I did love it. I did enjoy it. And everyone that worked on the album was wonderful. And it was really, in some ways, I think the happiest I've been when I've been writing and making an album. And I know there's a big theory that goes around that you must suffer for your art, you know, it's not real art unless you suffer. And uh, I don't believe this, because I think in some ways this is the most complete work that I've done. In some ways it is the best. And uh, I was the happiest that I've been compared to making other albums. Classic Albums is produced by John Pigeon. I'm Richard Skinner. Our special thanks to Kate Bush. Next week's classic album on Radio 1 is ABC's Lexicon of Love.